Today, you 2012. To everyone out there, I would like to introduce Mr. Bruce Perrins. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. Always very fun. And uh, so I want to talk about the state of open source a little and about open hardware. So first of all, why is this crazy guy dressed this way for linux.conf.au? Obviously, no one else is. And the reason is that I am being an external representative. And I want you guys to think about outward facing. We do very good inward facing. We work very well with each other. And it is the outside world that I want you to think about some more. So what have we learned from all of this open source and Linux stuff that we're doing? I'm going to talk about that, and then I'm going to talk about open hardware. The most important thing, though, is we've been both a tremendous success and a failure. And we have to learn from our failures and fix some of the things that were going wrong. So let's look at some of the goals put forward by open source proponents. So let's help a world population that increasingly works, communicates, learns, and votes through computers. Let's help those guys to be in control rather than being the controlled. So they should be able to uh, find out and control what the hardware and software that they use does rather than be the ones done to. And today in the world, people are done to. <laughs> we have in the States right now, the steelware, there's a 99% and then there's a 1%. And generally it's the 1% who are the doers and the rest of us are done to. So you should be able to control your own information completely. If you're so inclined, you should be able to change the software by yourselves. These are some goals that people like Richard Stallman, even myself, put forward quite a while ago. And today we have a pretty bad situation. People are increasingly slaves of their tools. And what has changed to make this so is that those tools contain embedded constraints upon the actions of people who use them. Consider, for example, the iPhone. Now, people love their iPhones because their iPhones enable them in so many ways, and they don't always understand that their iPhones also constrain them. Same with their set-top boxes. We love to watch videos on Netflix in the States, okay? Part of their function is to not do what you want when that action might reduce the profit of Apple or a media company or upset a cellular carrier or the government or even when some action is the wrong choice for the computer naive user, for example, running Flash on an iPhone. And thus people increasingly live in a world of constraint where the devices that they have in which they use to interface with the world actually constrain them from doing things. So what's the harm? What's the harm in having an iPad or an iPhone that maybe doesn't do everything you want? What's the harm in being a slave to your tool? It is that you are a slave to whoever controls that tool. So is this really important? Well, it is if you like democracy. People who vote based on the information they receive, well, these days they're getting that information more and more over the net. You're not going to have an antenna or cable television be the main way that you receive media for very long. It's going to be coming in through a digital intermediate. And news and political discourse are mediated by software, and they're going to be even more mediated in Apple TV, they are today in your computer. And we trust an astonishingly few companies to be the intermediaries between information and the user. So why is this open source's job? After all, you just wanted to write software. Okay, this is below your pay grade, right? Okay. Open source is the only credible producer of software and no hardware that isn't bound to a single company's economic interest. And thus, we are the guys 
who can give people freedom and the ladies. We have no reason to believe that we can trust companies or governments to do this job for us. So what else should our goals be? Establish continuing legal freedom to create, modify, and redistribute open source hardware and software. It's a simple goal. Open source should be legal, and we're at risk from laws that weren't directed at us when we weren't economically significant. For example, software patenting. We've been really lucky with that because, at least in the States, it could have shut us down. Okay, and it hasn't been used that way. Anti-circumvention law like DMCA has an information control function, and it also excludes us. We're shut out of content access because we aren't the guys who lock people down. Okay, so then we have new law that's really a problem. Uh, general purpose computing is increasingly a threat to companies and governments, anti-hacking, and, and when they say hacking, they mean computer crime legislation. It threatens the tools that we use to maintain security, and it threatens people who are indeed experts in computer security. They have to work under constraints. What they do has to remain secret. They can't tell us what's wrong with their tools increasingly. Legislation for the protection of intellectual property threatens both our tools and our infrastructure. For example, in the United States, we have this SOPA law, which had uh, DNS provisions that would have really handicapped the internet. And finally, we got the Obama administration to come out against us. Of course, it's an election year, so we don't know if that means anything. Um, 3D printers. 3D printers are very threatening things to many people outside of our community because you can make guns with them. <laughs> you can make hypodermic needles. You can make all sorts of things that your government doesn't want you to have with a 3D printer and you can send the file to someone else, okay? Thus, the lawmakers want to ban or very tightly control our tools. So why is it so, so difficult for us to be heard? Why do we have trouble fighting this SOPA law in the United States? Okay, while tremendously successful, open source is mostly not built a relationship with the common person and does not have their sympathy. In fact, there are lots of people in the world who believe that we are the people who make the viruses on their computer systems. I've heard that one before, okay? Open source has, to a great extent, been used as a tool for controlling people, too, okay? I, for my sins, am the creator of a program called BusyBox. BusyBox is in all these TiVos and other devices which are locked down and don't let people do what they like. You know, we gave them that capability. We didn't charge them for it. We, we did good things and some bad things came back too. Um, BusyBox is also uh, interesting because there are 10 times as much legal text about BusyBox now as there is actually lines of source code. <laughs> um, I didn't plan it and in retrospect I should have continued to lead the project. Um, Okay, open source has not been able to protect its own future by reforming law that is hostile to it. Despite our popularity and our legal victories, our developers face greater risks today than they ever have, and we need to make changes if we're going to be able to help ourselves. Okay? We have to reach the common man. We haven't yet developed any sympathy for users that is manifested by companies like Apple. But we have already achieved many things that would have been considered absolutely impossible. Okay, and we can do this as well. What it's going to take that we have mostly not shown so far is tremendous self-discipline in the subset of our community who achieves these goals. So what projects have best shown and most benefited from their sympathy for the user? Okay, Mozilla Foundation demonstrates really good self-discipline. Wikipedia. It's intrinsically more accessible to the common person than most of the things that we do. Okay, and then we'll discuss Ubuntu. So let's face it, most of us don't even like users. 
Okay, we call them losers. We make the software for ourselves and the other developers. Why should we like them? Okay, nothing's more annoying than that complaining user who says, you know, your software stinks and he's never contributed anything. And it's difficult to listen to that kind of person. He's not technically able con to contribute to the effort. He has no appreciation of your personal sacrifice. You know, I could have been with my kid instead of doing this in making that software. And he still discusses your work with great umbrage. You know, he really resents that he was made to download and run this software. Okay, and thus we have trouble getting, getting along with users and responding to their accurate complaints about our software. Okay, but when our work gratifies only ourselves and our community, it's self-limiting. A good many of us, unfortunately, match the stereotype of socially impaired programmers, but not all of you do. We'd rather hack in private. I'd rather hack in private than almost anything else. It's up to the rest of us to build bridges with normal folks if we want to achieve the goals that we started out with making this free software and that have really gone by the wayside. So let's look at a Mozilla and Ubuntu. Ubuntu is definitely demonstrating the discipline that we need for open source to reach the common person. The problem is that Ubuntu is in the position of being an intermediary between the open source developer community and the rest of the world, as is Red Hat, as are other open source companies, and sometimes even Microsoft, because Microsoft is such a big participant in open source these days that they even speak for us. We need to look at the problems of these intermediary companies. So let's be honest with and also honest about our partners. We have to accept that our commercial partners, Red Hat, Ubuntu, etc., must always put the interest of their business before all else. Okay, it's actually legally required of them if they're a public stock company. The interest of their commercial partners also constrains what they can do very heavily and they need those partners to do their business. They can't really work for the best interest of open source. Okay, you heard it here first, right? Red Hat doesn't work for the best interest of open source, nor does Ubuntu. Certainly TiVo does not, okay? They must always strike a balance that's in their interest. So where did we go wrong with intermediaries? Well, there was a time when free software and open source clearly held a moral high ground and that gave us some political progress that we just aren't making any longer. Consider the push for open standards uh, about 10 years ago in the fight against pan-European software patenting. We won those things and we might not have won them today. We're losing ground on net neutrality. SOPO is a very scary thing and still may hurt us. As commercial companies, took the foreground in open source, we lost the moral high ground that let us have progress on these issues. Today, we're just another competitor. Okay, so our intermediaries represent us. When open source is represented in a political forum today, it's often red hat. You know, Mike Tiemann goes up and speaks. Okay, it's an open source company or it's Linux Foundation, which is owned. You know, for better or worse, Linux Foundation is owned by companies whose goal is to make money by being the intermediary between us and the user, okay? So much as I like the Linux Foundation people personally, the Linux Foundation as an organization does not necessarily work in our interest. Okay, those companies and the groups they have created represent their own best interests. It's like the Chamber of Commerce. Does the Chamber of Commerce in your town want to make the town better and prettier? No, they want to make it better for business. Okay, and that's all that is fair to expect of them. Okay, I'm not saying you're bad because this is what you're like. I'm saying this is what you're like, business people. And that's why they're wrong for the role of representing us. Okay, so working for free to make Mark Shuttleworth richer just isn't very smart, okay? It doesn't mean you shouldn't work on Ubuntu. 
It means that you should always keep track of whether that community, whether our community, gets more from Ubuntu or at least an even amount from what Ubuntu gets from us. And what's going to happen tomorrow, okay, is what we put into Ubuntu today going to be worth it tomorrow when maybe they're not so close to us as they have diverged from, Red Hat, uh, from Debian over time, okay? And then you guys should decide where your valuable work should go. My opinion is that it should go into a nonprofit, if that's possible. Okay, make sure your presence is known independently of Ubuntu. And this is a horrible tragedy with Debian because the Debian guys, they make Ubuntu, okay? Ubuntu puts frosting on what Debian does to a very great extent. And does anyone even care about Debian anymore? Yeah, okay, so, so, okay, there's a little difference between you guys and everybody outside of the room, okay? And um, I think you would actually have a hard time taking a person who isn't quite as into Linux as you are and explaining why Debian is important today, okay? And that is a problem, and, and I feel that we're failing in self-promotion. Okay. Oh, but self-promotion is obnoxious. Okay, if you don't blow your own horn, nobody else will, guys. Okay, so are we being served? Just making a better platform than our competition is Ubuntu and its ilk are approaching Windows and user desirability is an insufficient goal if they just end up being significantly proprietary. Just Windows from a different company. Okay, same for Android. If Android is, is just iPhone from a different company, it's not fulfilling the goals that we really should have for open source and free software. Okay, and then we have this cry, users, 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 Uber Alas. So, so yeah, users are important, but it's a hollow philosophy if we're just giving the users the same stuff from a different vendor. So with what we've learned, what what can we do to meet today's and future challenges? Okay, so open source in an app world. This is a big problem for us because the mobile app paradigm has succeeded economically. Okay, the large early entrant reward for reasonably simple apps on a single platform was tremendous at the start. And it seeded a lot of people who were still in this business. And because the apps address the failure of the web, okay, the fact that you have apps on your phone means the web failed if your phone has continuous networking, okay, that has made apps successful. Open source is being sold as apps. Okay, there are people who sell my personal software and make a good deal of money from it to people who don't even know it's open source and don't understand that they could get the same thing for free elsewhere. Ultimately, apps are going to be a front end for content, and it's the content, not the apps, where the continuing value is going to lie. But paid content providers have shown a trend to lock their stuff down in favor of DRM, and obviously this is continuing to be a threat to us. How can we challenge? this success. Very hard thing, but you're very smart people. Okay. Mobile apps, from the user's perspective, are a symptom of the open web's failure to keep up with the best technology and meet user needs. We're back to the issue of not having enough sympathy for the user if we expect them to go to the website and use the website from their handheld, and the website doesn't work all that well. The handicapped people suffer the most because apps do not accommodate them. But the lesson we should really learn here is if JavaScript was sufficient to meet the issue, there wouldn't be apps today. We need a better paradigm than HTML5 or indeed HTML provides to meet the user. Okay, every problem that proprietary software has is duplicated in apps, but worse because they're meant to be ephemeral, 
ephemeral. So everything that we didn't like about Microsoft in the 80s and 90s, true today, we can meet this challenge by changing the paradigm beyond the web or apps. How do we do that? Will we? Okay. And we have a challenge today. We have open hardware, a new outgrowth of open source. And the hardware trend that we have to fight is from generic platforms like the PC motherboard towards single company, single network, highly controlled platforms with content digital rights management and the hardware subsidized by network tolls like the iPhone. This eventually leaves us with nowhere to run open source operating systems as open source rather than something locked down. And it leaves us with only jail environments for our applications, ones that heavily regulate what we can do with our applications. And we, the application creators, can't control them. Can open hardware balance this trend, providing an open software platform that's desirable to the common people? If not, is it going to be our destiny to live in a world of constraint? I think this is a problem that you can solve or that you can ignore. I'd prefer to see you solve it for the world. So where do you want to go today? Open source has achieved tremendous things. Nobody would have believed them possible. We've boundless potential like open hardware lying right in front of us, but we're also seeing some signs that we have peaked. Okay, Linux, open source, they have peaked in the eyes of many people, which means it's down from here, guys. Okay, our antithesis, the lockdown platform is beating us in lots of ways today. So which way will it be? It's up to you. Now let's talk about open hardware. So open hardware is the design of physical objects or an electronic circuit that is shared under the same terms as open source software. And the objective is to have the same sort of collaboration that occurs with open source software. So like open source software and Linux, we have enabling factors that are making this revolution possible. For Linux and open source, the enabling factors were the internet, frustration with the state of software, we hated those blue screens, etc., and an extremely low point of entry to be able to produce software. So if you owned a laptop, you could pretty much be a software creator. So let's consider the impact of the internet for a moment. We did the impossible. Imagine if I, 10 years ago, had told someone in my family who wasn't a software person this. Okay, my friends and I, we're going to get together and write an encyclopedia. The authors aren't going to be paid, but we will write 3,422,000 articles just in English. Okay, and we're going to kill Microsoft and Carta and most commercial encyclopedias, and we'll do it in just a decade. Okay, what would have been the response of people, had you said that to them just 10 years ago, they'd say, you're dropping acid, guy. Okay? Okay, and imagine telling someone this forecast 10 years ago, two students' hobby projects will supplant the operating system and GUI efforts of AT&T, IBM, and their billion-dollar consortia, the X consortia, Taligent, Monterey, all these things that they spent tons of money to replace Unix, okay, did not work, and Linus and some other people, their stuff did work, okay. They'd ask, are you, is it C you're using or LSD? So much of the evolution of open source is filled with things that would have been thought to be impossible just a few years before they happened. And this is what you call an emergent phenomenon. No one maybe with the exception of Richard Stallman thought it would take place until it was already underway. <laughs> Okay, I, I know I'm in a good crowd of people applaud for RMS, okay? <laughs> um, there, there's, nobody leads a more difficult life than him, and we have to honor the guy because he lives the life that he would have us live, and he has dedicated his entire life to this in a way that I don't think anybody else has. So let's go on. Applause 
So we should look at the factors that combined to produce this phenomenon and then look forward. Okay, so before and after the internet. Well, it used to be that when strange things happened, the news would report, police believe these are the actions of an isolated nut job. Okay, there are no isolated nut jobs on the internet. Okay, whatever kind of nut job you are, there are 50 nut jobs just like you in the internet. It doesn't matter where they live. Okay, because you can find them. Okay, and 50 people with the same crazy idea and some spare time have more creative power than the typical startup company. Okay, I've run startup companies. If we have five developers, we're lucky. Okay, and they can do things that those big companies can't. So what were the results for open source? Well, we saw the rise of online communities that wanted to get something done, the creation of an economic paradigm. Okay, open source isn't religion, it's an economic paradigm. It's a way for people to create important products together, and it's very different from the way that companies typically, typically do it. We don't capitalize first and write later. We don't finish it before we release. A lot of things are very different. So open source can actually produce products that the conventional paradigm could never finance, okay? And the web, surprisingly, was one of these things. If you look at the way Ted Nelson started out to make the web in the Xanadu project and he knew what he wanted, the first thing he did was put in a way for the web to make money. And then he spent the rest of his life trying to make the way for the web to make money work. Okay, and it never did. Okay, so what happened with Tim Berners-Lee is he said, you know what, I'm going to just give people the web and let them figure out how they're going to make money. So what we got is this incredible economic boom and then an economic collapse. And probably a lot of people tur cursing out Tim Berners-Lee, but he did the right thing because he let the market figure out how to do it. So anyway, we have these motivated individuals that create the tools to make the tools as an individual effort to start with, and then they share them. And this broader development grows from those seeds. And then we see a multiplier effect. So when, when I released BusyBox, it had 35 commands. Now it has over 200, which I didn't write, uh, for example. OK, so it's happening again. Now we're in the same place that we were when Linux and open source software were starting up, but for hardware. And we have another set of enabling factors. So we start out with all the things we had before. Uh, an internet to bring us together, the economic paradigm that we created for open source, which works well today, the software tool collection, and everything that we have learned about collaboration. When I first worked on Debian, Debian actually flew at one point on the space shuttle. And we had not really known until that point that a couple hundred people who never physically met. Okay, I knew one other Debian developer face to face at that time could just put together a big system and that the big system would actually work. That was not a thing that was known until that point. Okay, so we've learned a tremendous lot about collaboration. Now we add this new phenomenon, which is the transformation of hardware into software. So hardware, software now. A new wave of 3D printers makes it possible to print solid objects the way we used to print photographs. Computer-aided design systems let us design those objects as if we were writing software, and then let us share the designs and collaborate on the designs. And then we have a number of hardware innovations. The gate array is a platform for us to create and immediately run a very complex digital logic design. For example, you can design a new CPU with new instructions that has never existed before, you load that digital logic design into a gate array, and now your CPU is running. So this gives us tremendous power. And formerly, when I, I, I worked on a chip, and it was 
a revolutionary chip at the time. It was a driver for a very high resolution video dis display at Pixar. And when I worked on that, we had to test our design very thoroughly because if we didn't get a working chip out the first time, it would take us six months to turn it. Okay, not anymore. You can turn a design in 10 minutes. So we've got this tremendous enabling change. The complex programmable logic device, the CPLD, is another of these. It enables us to program analog and digital circuits, analog and digital, as if they were software, and immediately run them on chips that cost less than a dollar. So what we used to call glue chips, and we hated glue chips because they just connected things together. They didn't do the work. Those are all in this CPLD and they're much easier and you can change them without changing the printed circuit board. So the physical complexity and the cost of those circuits is reduced tremendously and uh, changing them is now again something you can do in 10 minutes. No soldering iron. Okay, the tremendous power of CPUs allows digital signal processing to replace the analog electronics of the past. So I've built radios, and when you built a radio 20, 30 years ago, it was all analog, <coughs> analog amplifiers, analog filters, and analog oscillators. Okay, and now those are all algorithms, and we actually digitize right after the antenna. We connect that uh, antenna to a very simple preamp. We connect that to a digital to analog, I'm sorry, an analog to digital converter, and we get a signal which then we can implement all of what we used to do with our soldering iron as algorithms. And, makes it very easy and powerful to do communications things that were very hard and expensive to do before. So we also have cheap, fast manufacturing of printed circuit boards and surface mount electronics, although they're hard to see without a magnifier, are reduced in cost so far that individuals can easily afford to fabricate or have made new circuits in large quantities which can be profitably sold. And I'm sorry that many of you missed yesterday's Arduino mini forum, because it shows some examples of that. So let's look at some of this hardware that's coming out of this revolution. So Arduino is really kind of the Linux of open hardware right now. So this is the most used device for the moment. It's a general purpose embedded CPU. It's easier to program than other things that have been available. It's got a standard form for daughter boards and that is very, very important. The daughter boards are called shields and many designs are plugged together with no soldering. So several hundred different shields are available that implement different applications on top of this general purpose CPU. And to show you how cheap this is, there was one in my goodie bag as a speaker. Okay, and this is not a rich conference. So, okay, it's an open source platform and open source hardware design, 20 to $30 assembled. In the United States, they now sell them in the Radio Shack store. Okay, the chip costs $2 to $17, depending on how much I.O. you need, flash RAM, etc. So having prototyped on this, you can move it to the same chip in your own design and have it be much cheaper in your production unit. And I'm a ham radio operator. My call sign is K6BP, or in this case, K6BP Portable VK. And... Um, so Ardent Data makes this radio shield and it plugs into the Arduino and does this wireless protocol that the hams have to tell everyone where we are. So I can be in my car and I can see if there's another ham coming close and talk to them or ask them to do something, etc. And of course we use this for emergencies uh, as well. You know, California has four seasons, fires, floods, earthquakes, and riots. So the hams are really... <laughs> well enabled with the cops to help out because the uh, uh, public services never have enough communications in a disaster. So we, we come in with this equipment and we know where everyone is and we can do stuff that the police can't. Um, 
So there are over 250 Arduino shields from about 110 manufacturers. Not all are open hardware. Okay, some of them are proprietary, but they tell you how to program them. And given a problem, there's probably already a plug-in hardware implementation to solve it. So the ham radio shield was an example of, here's something not everyone would think of. They have robot shields with the wheels on the bottom and all that. Whatever you want to do, you can now do in the Arduino. The programming environment, actually you can choose what you program it in, but what we generally give people is uh, wiring language, which they can uh, use even if they're artists. It's sort of a C dialect. And the fact that it comes with that language and an IDE that makes it very easy for an artist, not a hardware hacker, to program this has really helped. Uh, if you ever have the opportunity to go to Burning Man, you will actually see lots of Arduinos in art applications there. Um, okay, so why Arduino instead of something else? Community, community, community. It's 100% open source. It has the people. Google selected it as the USB interface platform for the standard Android plug-in accessory, which I thought was really cool because they're using Apple's closeness against them. Okay, it uses the AVR CPU, so you can use the same CPU in production units. They're very cheap without the Arduino. And it approaches the price for these other cheap processors. Why not use it? Not 32 bits. Okay, Linux 32-bit operating system. Okay, Leaf Labs Maple uh, runs the Cortex M3. Doesn't quite run full Linux, but it's very cheap and it's 32-bit. There are other things. TI Beagle Board, Panda Board run uh, smart class, smartphone class platforms, $100 development platforms. Okay, so if it won't work on Arduino, you use one of those. So here are the kind of chips that you can do development with today if you're making a wireless device. Let's make wireless devices. Let's make mobiles. Let's not have Motorola or something be the only company that makes them. So this particular chip costs $25, has four separate CPUs in them. There are actually three different architectures. So there's an ARM, a floating point DSP chip, and then there are two separate chips that are very small things that just talk to your peripherals and make, wake up the main processor. So you can manage the power so that it's very low while it's waiting for you to push a button because only one of these little CPUs is on. And then it has all of these peripheral devices that you would ever want to have in a, a pocket or wireless device. Um, so $95 for a development platform for that that's already assembled, runs Linux out of the box. This is what it looks like. Okay, that's an open hardware design. The specifications are online. So we end up with products like this. And this is interesting. There's a guy now who makes a new open hardware design every month and has it made and sells it. That's his job. Okay, and he has made this device called the DSO Quad, a digital storage oscilloscope with entirely open source, both hardware and software internals. Look how big it is. Okay, this is, this is my four trace oscilloscope. And if I don't want it to be an oscilloscope, I can program it to run tests on my hardware with a completely separate user interface. Okay. These are the tools that open hardware is making today. Okay, that's what it looks a little closer up. Uh, and this, um, you have 8-bit uh, digital to analog, so not tremendously high resolution, but inexpensive, goes up to 80 volts on a times one probe. We just use a, a times 10 if we're using higher voltage. So I would have paid Tektronix $2,000 for this. This is one of my favorites, the Bus Pirate. Okay, what do you 
do when you start to program a new hardware device. The first thing that you have to do is figure out how to interface it. Or if it happens you want to get the data out of that TiVo that TiVo doesn't want you to have, you have to interface to that in some way. Well, the Bus Pirate is the device that does this for you, and it is $30. It is a general purpose open source hacker multi-tool that talks to electronic stuff. It's got a bunch of features. An intrepid hacker might need to prototype their next project. General purpose, 0 to 5.5 volt interfaces. And we've got all kinds of protocols. So it can do frequency measurement. It can do uh, bus traffic sniffing that's already programmed in. Uh, it has a bootloader so you can update its firmware with open source. It can be a logic analyzer. It can program microcontrollers. You don't need an AVR programmer. This runs AVR dude. It uh, programs FPGAs and CPLDs. It's uh, scriptable from Perl or Python. Uh, it works in multiple languages. And Creative Commons zero source, OK? So you can do whatever you want with that. OK, it does JTAG. These are all ways that chips talk together. MIDI is a way that musical instruments talk together. Uh, will tell you what the internals of your car is doing, for example. You can tap into various car digital buses with that. OK, here's another. This is prototyping for replacing those glue chips. Replace the complex logic chips with $1 chips, runs multiple voltage levels. Development kit, 15 bucks. OK, all you need to be started and then buy the chips for a dollar apiece. OK, this is one of my favorites. It's a 200 megahertz gate array development board with two channels of USB. And uh, it's very low priced. And you know that's $75 per 500,000 digital logic units, OK? Um, and this is powerful enough that the programmer, the, the developer of this actually wrote an AVR processor in it and then made it emulate an Arduino. So what happens is you can take what this is supposed to do and you can program it for the Arduino and make sure that works before you implement your custom digital logic design, which of course works a thousand times faster. Okay, so extremely powerful stuff, whatever kind of hardware you want to make. All open source hardware design and software. Okay, that's what it looks like. It's actually very small. OK, so what can you do with that? We have um, a design that is 20 simultaneous radio receivers on one chip. OK, so whatever 20 channels you want to modulate, it will do so. Actually, wide bands, so you can get much more than 20 actual channels because you process it in software afterward. OK. That obviously takes in external components like uh, analog to digital converter. OK, so let's get into physical stuff for those of you who aren't as interested in electronics. So this is MakerBot. MakerBot is a 3D printer. Its design is open source. It makes small thermoplastic objects from your computer models. It hasn't reached the really critical milestone, which is the resolution is too low to make really good Lego. OK? The studs don't hold together as well as we would like. And if you make stuff, it, it looks kind of jaggy. You have to sand it off or paint it at the end. So obviously, we're waiting for resolution to be better. And once my kid can make Lego minifigs, I will have to buy this. There will just be no choice. Um, OK, so this is one piece. OK, this, these are not woven, et cetera. And I saw another one was made by a commercial 3D printer, not an open source one. But uh, what I saw was actually a gearbox that cannot be opened. It was made as one piece. And it had moving gears inside. And the way they did that was they printed the gears as plastic, and they printed the spaces between them as wax. And then they melted the wax out. OK, and, and so they had moving parts and axles that actually worked, et cetera. So 
make anything you want eventually. Only make really small, crappy-looking things right now. Um, Okay, it's, it's like, you know, open source when we just started. Can you make a MakerBot with a MakerBot? No. Okay, you can print. This is where the hype comes in. Okay, you can print some of the mechanical parts to make another printer using your printer. You can't come close to making the whole thing. There are no factories that make other factories, which is a good thing because we probably wouldn't be here if there were. Um, Output is jaggy, okay, uh, you have to sand things if you want to make a radio case or a knob or something, but it's fine for prototypes if you put in the work. Okay, then we get really dangerous, you thought making weapons was a threat. This is open polymerase chain reaction, okay, genetic engineering at home. Okay, have the great body you've always wanted whether it's yours or someone else's. And I broke the rules, sorry. And um, other tools such as column electrophoresis, which is uh, very important for genetic engineering, it lets you read what the genome is, are well within the reach of the hobbyist. Okay, so this is a sea perch. I actually taught a class on this in uh, Norway with grant from their federal government. It's a remotely operated submarine built from PVC pipe, pill bottles, wax, pipe insulation. The electronic parts from, from, come from DigiKey or, or your Australian equivalent. So we built this in the class. The class was all science teachers, so they were taking this all home to their students. And then we dropped it in the harbor in Lillesand, Norway, and sailed around with a TV camera clamped on it. It was absolutely beautiful down there. Okay, and much more comfortable than diving. Um, okay, so I, I think right now the, the project that did this at MIT is uh, selling kits, or you can you know go to the home store and just get this pipe and make it yourself. The, uh, Motor insulators are actual uh, journal boxes made from wax and pill bottles. Okay, so you can do some incredible things. Um, hello, I'm pushing the button. Okay, so we have a couple minutes in which you can either run out for tea or ask me questions. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Speakers, questions? This should be working. No, here. Uh, this may have changed, but one of the big problems with FPGAs has always been that last synthesis stage of converting from, say, Verilog or HDL to uh, basically the gate configuration. And a lot of the chip manufacturers have always kept that stage a proprietary secret. And open source or free software has never quite gotten to the point of being able to do that stage. Has that changed? Or if not, is there something we can do about it? Do you know David Rowe? Okay, I want you to talk with David about proprietary things that are magic. Because uh, he is probably the best person in our community about debunking that whole thing. And um, he has actually been doing work for us on open source line echo canceller. So the fact that asterisk works really well is his fault. Um, and uh, has uh, recently made, motivated by hands, but it's going to be tremendously useful everywhere, a uh, digital voice codec that's down to 1400 bits per second with telephone line quality and will go lower than that. Um, and uh, what David has found approaching these things is that they are said to be magic until you actually dive in. And then you find that it's just programming, but you might have to know some math that other people don't know yet. Um, and uh, this is actually the same kind of problem as compiler optimization, I feel. And yes, we can solve it. We might not always solve it as, as good as the proprietary folks, but today we solve it well enough to run our designs. I do want people working on these issues because too often we're running proprietary software to design our open source gate array designs. The other thing is we don't have an open source gate array. The bit streams are themselves proprietary. Doesn't have to be, you can design a gate array in a gate array 
And having done so, you can have it produced on bare silicon. And we need folks who know things that I do not know, so I am not doing it. Um, but some of you guys are much more capable than I, as David was, you know, for Codex. Ne who's, who's next? Next question. Oh, come on, guys. You were listening, weren't you? I'm sorry? Oh. Thank you. Um, given... I just want to ask the, a horrible question about the licensing issue, that once we take a license that it pretty much assumes the hardware was generic and it pre-existed the software and then we licensed the software, but now we have the option of arbitrarily moving software into hardware and hardware into software and crossing that divide with impunity. Um, do we have issues with things like what TVO, TV, TiVo did and the like with do we need to think seriously about um, licensing for, the, for this sort of software that's going to exist in this amorphous space between hardware and software? So a lot of people in our community actually resent that I work on licensing because um, they find it threatening, hard to understand, and let's face it, intellectual property gets in our way. But we have serious issues, um, and the issues are only worse for hardware because we cannot use copyright the way we did for software once we're doing hardware designs. And um, I'd be very happy to discuss this until you're sorry I started offline. Um, okay, I think it's uh, time, last moment where you can grab a spot of tea. So thank you very much.